Welcome to Community Church. It's so good to have you here. Uh, I see some faces I don't necessarily recognize, so I'll introduce myself. My name's Alan Cleveland. I'm the senior pastor here, and it's great to have you here in this albeit odd season that we've been in. And of course, we hear that pretty much wherever we go, right? Uh, things are just not quite the way we're used to, but it's good to have you here with us today as we come into this time in which we engage with God's Word. And over the past number of weeks, we've been going through the Apostles' Creed a phrase at a time. And our purpose in going into the Apostles' Creed, there are several reasons. Uh, it's a great launching point to dig into God's Word. The Apostles' Creed itself is not inspired by God, but it is a great tool that can be used in our lives uh, so that it causes us to dig deep into what God has revealed in his word and therefore apply it to our lives. And uh, because we want to build our lives on the foundation of God's word. And so what the Apostles' Creed does is it consolidates, it condenses down to a few uh, incredible statements, uh, uh, truths uh, that are contained within scriptures, the truths of the, of the Christian life. As one writer put it, uh, we can believe things beyond uh, the Apostles' Creed, but this is like the core, this is like the, the center stuff that uh, we have in our faith that's been revealed in Scripture. And so let's take a moment and recite it together. Uh, recite with me, please. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, as we look at this statement, what, what captivates my heart about it, is, is just its, its longevity. You know, by that I mean, well, I grew up in a tradition where we didn't cite the Apostles' Creed, so when I first started uh, exploring it and learning it, I was like, oh, wow, okay. You know, it, but it, it, the depth of it, you consider that uh, people, God's people, have been reciting these words for roughly 1,600 years. 1,600 years. Whether there's been a pandemic going on, whether there's been strife and warfare, whether kingdoms have risen or kingdoms have fallen, this statement, this creed, has bound the hearts of God's people over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Therefore, it's a, it's a powerful statement. And, and maybe even as we were reciting it right now in your heart, you were going, yes, this is, this is fantastic. It's, just a, it's such a summation of, of all that I believe, of all that I understand from God's Word. But even, even though our hearts might be saying, yes, there might be a little pause in there too, Right? Because there are a couple of statements in there that's like, okay, you know, one of them that we'll get to in a couple of weeks is a reference to the Catholic Church because people go, oh, wait a minute, what's, oh, what, are we, what are we becoming here? And it's like, no, 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 it didn't say Roman Catholic Church, it says a Catholic, that is universal church, and we'll talk about that again in a few weeks. But the other statement that might cause some pause, you know, you look at it, you recite it, and you're like, oh. Uh, what's that mean? When he, when he says he descended into hell. So today we're going to be looking at he descended to hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. Now, so let's start with he descended to hell. What, what does that mean? I mean, if you wondered that, you're in good company. 
Someone suggested, why don't we just go from he was crucified, died, and was buried, and then jump down to, and on the third day he rose again. And just leave it out. And as a matter of fact, there are some groups and some uh, church associations, denominations, that because it just, they're not sure what to make of the phrase, they, they do, they drop it out. It, it throws people, especially in light of uh, those verses in Luke where it records Jesus hanging on the cross and, and the two criminals are on either side of him. And at first, there's some debate amongst them. And then uh, one of them says, don't you fear God? Don't you see we deserve to be here? This man does not remember me today. Wherever you're going to go, remember me. And Jesus said to this criminal, today you'll be with me in paradise. Uh, Then a little bit later on, he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Now, previous to this, he did say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your back on me? He did say that, but now we're at a point where Jesus has gone through that point, and now he's He's talking about today you'll be with me in paradise. And, and Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It, it doesn't sound like he's planning to go to hell. So then therefore we have to step back a minute and, and we tend to go with what we're familiar with and trying to understand something that's new. You know, or if we come across something that maybe we've seen numerous times, we try to understand what it means by, you know, plugging in things we're familiar with. So like with the word hell, it's quite possible many of us recognize it. Oh, come on. We all recognize that people use it as a punctuation mark, don't they? Uh, they use it as, a, as something they insert into a sentence to give that sentence a little more pizzazz, a little more punch. If somebody's annoying, you know, it's, it's something we say to kind of like, get out of my face, go to. And, and so we use it in that way. And we're familiar with its use in that way. Now, I'm going to take a little aside, a little bit of a detour Um, because I want to say something that words matter, okay? You hear what I said? Words matter. And and the reason why I state that is because if we use words like hell casually, when people hear us using words like that casually, what does it communicate to them? What does it say to them about what we mean about that word? about the value we place on it. Oh, it could be a word like hell. It could be a word like damn. Uh, you know, that within a right context, it's, it's one thing. But typically, the way we use it to punctuate our, our conversations or in our writing and emails or texts or whatever, oh, we have a different meaning. But words matter. If I treat hell, just simply as a punctuation mark, or something to say to somebody who's being annoying, I'm treating it casually, what that communicates to the people around me. What does that communicate to the people around me? You see, the fact is, Jesus spoke about hell. Is hell real? Yes. How do we know hell is real? In part, because Jesus said it's real. Now, he used the word Gehenna. And Gehenna, people in the, in the time of Jesus would have recognized it as a place outside of the city walls of Jerusalem in which there was a fire going on. It was, a, it was the dump. And people would bring their stuff there, and there was fire constantly going to consume what was there. And and not only was there fire, it was just a place of decomposition. There was a place where things just rotted and fell apart. 
And the interesting thing is that when Jesus spoke about Gehenna, most often he spoke about Gehenna when he was talking to people who were feeling rather religiously superior, feeling religiously good, that, that they could stack up all their deeds and say, look at all the good things that I have done, God. Aren't you thankful for me? And, and the picture that we're getting here, that we can draw from here, in part, hell takes care of all those false things that we assert to prove our worth, to prove our value. Now, we're going to be looking at it in a few more weeks, in the next week or so. But I just want to challenge you, if you struggle with the use of language like that, think about what you say because words matter. Hell is real. And Jesus treated as real. We need to treat it as real. So let's not treat it casually. We also have to come to an understanding of what hell is, in part because we're mainly informed by what Hollywood tells us hell is. You know, we, we have these pictures in our head of, you know, burning, somebody walking around with a pointy tail and a pitchfork, or whatever we have, whatever pictures come to our minds, or maybe something from the latest horror film we watched. So that when we come to this and we say we believe that Jesus descended to hell, you know, we reference those pictures and it's like, okay, wait a minute here. Is that what was being alluded to? Is that what they were talking about? Someone might say, well, you know, Pastor, I know from 1 Peter 3.19, you know, in my church that I grew up in, uh, hell was that place that Jesus went to and he preached to the, to the souls that were in hell. And if you look at 1 Peter 3.19, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, actually there are a number of questions we need to ask. Number one, what spirits? It's not obvious from the context. Uh, what is that reference to the prison? Now, some denominations, some churches have gone all out, and, and I was reading uh, uh, or I was listening to one gentleman, he said there are hundreds of ways that this verse gets interpreted. It's a challenging verse. But what I, you know, there are so many questions about it that it's best not to build too much upon just that one verse. And so we need to step back and ask, okay, what, what was the meaning that the, that the writers of the Apostles' Creed, what were they going for? And J.I. Packer, he was a theologian, he was a writer, he wrote a number of books like Knowing God and, and a powerful, powerful writer, um, and uh, just he had an impact on my life, his writings had an impact on my life. Actually, just the other day, on Friday, he went home to be with Jesus at the age of 93. But, but he was commenting on this, and he said this, to try to provide some context in what the writers of the Apostles' Creed originally meant. And he said, the English is misleading, for hell has changed its sense since the English form of the creed was fixed. Originally, hell meant the place of the departed such as such corresponding to the Greek Hades and the Hebrew Sheol. In other words, centuries ago when the Apostles' Creed was translated into English, the word hell had a different meaning. It, it meant more Sheol which is a Hebrew word which meant the place of the dead. In other words, we're alive right now. We're in the land of the living. If somebody dies, they go to Sheol. Uh, that is the land of the dead. That's where the spirits of the dead go. Now, from there, it, it can get pretty, pretty complicated, but those are the righteous, those who are God-fearing, go to what they call Abraham's bosom, to paradise. Those who don't love God, those who don't follow Christ, well, they, they go someplace else, and then there are other layers to it all. But, 
uh, the point is that with the, for the writers of the Apostles' Creed, the context originally meant that place of the dead. If you're alive, you're here on earth. If you're dead, then you're in Sheol. Now, the Creed challenges us to, to dig into Scripture again so that we don't just take the Creed's word for it because, again, the Creed is not inspired by God. So let's go into God's Word. And let's go to Acts chapter 2, because in Acts chapter 2, Peter is addressing the crowds in Jerusalem. And he's talking to them during the Feast of Pentecost. And this is a powerful chapter, because in this chapter, we are witnessing the birth of the church. Okay? This is where the church is birthed. Now, I have a daughter out in California, my second oldest daughter, uh, found out a few months ago that she is uh, going to be having a baby, and so just the other day she sent a sonogram, yeah, yay, and and in the sonogram it was moving and the baby was reaching for its face and the little heart was beating like crazy and it was just like, oh, that's awesome, that's great. You know, it's, it's, we're anticipating January when that little one, we can see and hold that little one. Well, in Acts chapter 2, here is the birth. Uh, The people had gathered together in Jerusalem, the Christ followers, those who had witnessed Jesus risen from the dead were gathered together. They're saying, God, what's next? And that's what we see. The Holy Spirit comes down, uh, pours out upon the people that are gathered there such that they go out into the streets and they're announcing the news, Jesus is risen, Jesus is risen. And they're doing it in the, in, the, uh, in the languages of other people. And people are like, wait a minute, these are uneducated people from the north. How do they know this language? How do they know that language? They're all talking about Jesus being risen from the dead. There's all this excitement there. Everybody is pumped up. And so some people were saying, you know what? Pretty early in the morning for them to be drinking. Uh-huh, yep. They're probably just a little bit tipsy right at the moment. And Peter stands up. He goes, no. They are excited because of what God is doing. And so he he starts in with a sermon in Acts chapter 2, you know, just sharing what God is doing. And, And then we get down to verse 22, and this is what we read. Men of Israel... Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God and with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced and my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life and you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. We've seen it. We've beheld it. This is what God has done. Now, as I was reading through that, I hope some of the, some of the high points jumped out at you. 
Uh, one of them being that Jesus was not at the wrong place at the wrong time and fell into the hands of the wrong people, that he died the wrong death. No, Jesus was at the right place at the right time, was seized and arrested by the right people and put through all that he went through and died the right death, all according to God's plan, according to God's purposes. God did this through Jesus. It wasn't by accident. It was all according to his plan and purposes. And in this, Peter quotes from Psalm chapter 16. And he says, now, David, King David, wrote this psalm, and we can point to his tomb. It's over there, and if we were to open it up, his bones would be there. He's there. But Psalm 16, David was allowed to see ahead, and and here's 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 the beautiful message that the Messiah's Spirit was not going to be left in Hades, in Sheol, another name for that, as a disembodied spirit. His body would not experience the corruption, that is, the decomposition that comes when the life has left the body. No. Yes, Jesus descended to Sheol, and yet. Now the disciples are certainly not expecting Jesus to be resurrected when they heard him cry out, it is finished. But now it's with complete certainty. The kind of certainty that shapes one's life. That shapes the the way that they live it, it, it forms a foundation, a new foundation upon which they were building their lives. Uh, Jesus experienced death completely. And Jesus could not be held by the power of death. He could not be held by Sheol. But God raised him up. And he said in verse 36 of Acts chapter 2, Let all the house of Israel know therefore... For certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Jesus is risen. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. Jesus fulfilled prophecy. If you were to read through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and especially in Matthew, but in the others also, there are references to Old Testament passages in the, in the Hebrew Scriptures where Jesus, it was, there were predictions about the coming Messiah. There were predictions that you could draw the line to, that pointed to the person of Jesus. And Jesus himself fulfilled what he said about himself See, the people that were gathering around Jesus, yes, there were his disciples. Yes, there were the crowds that were kind of coming along for the next thing, whether it was the next great story, the next great parable, the next great miracle, the next whatever that Jesus might do. And then there was that group that were walking around saying, Jesus, you know, hey, we know all the miracles you've done. Jesus, we've known all the teachings you've done. But, you know, it would be helpful if you just gave us one more miracle. And then then we'll figure it out. We'll assess. Just one more. Just one more. And Jesus looked at them, and he said this in Matthew chapter 12, in verse 40. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So will the Son of Man. That that was the title that Jesus took upon himself. So will the Son of Man who be in the heart of the earth. And and if you go back to Jonah chapter 2, when Jonah was praying out, he says, I'm in Sheol. I'm I'm in the land of the dead when he was in the belly of the great fish. So there's that correspondence and Jesus is saying, hey, that was a picture of what is yet to come. 
Oh, and then Paul reflecting on the power of the words that the ladies heard, those women who had gone to the tomb, who were preparing to take care of a body that was beaten, that was ripped to shreds by the whippings, that experienced severe blood loss, probably beyond recognition. They're going there to prepare a dead body, a lifeless body for, for a final resting place. And they heard those words. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen as he said. And Paul is reflecting on this, and he's talking about the resurrection. And, and in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he writes this uh, just as a testimony to the evidence of the resurrection. He said, starting in verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Uh, Paul gives this description. He says, here are all these witnesses who one day they're cowering in fear and wondering what is next because the one that they followed was dead and buried. So all of a sudden, this, this, this group of men and women whose lives are radically transformed and they're going out and declaring, Jesus is alive. And if you look at the evidences of the resurrection. You look at the accounts. You look at the, uh, the lineup of the accounts. If you look at the uh, historical po um, pointers that are there to be found, even in secular literature of that day where they talked about Jesus, this prophet of Israel who rose from the dead, even in some of those sources they acknowledged it to be true. But what was proven to be true were the lives of men and women who was radically transformed because of their faith in the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Now Paul, in wrestling with some people who were questioning about the resurrection, he says, hey, I want to address some things. And if the resurrection isn't real, then we're, we're really in bad shape. He said this, in, starting in verse 12 of 15, now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. He says there's a lot at stake in the resurrection, that, that if it hadn't taken place, then, then what are we doing? Our, our faith would be in vain if we put our trust in Christ, but he hadn't been raised. Body, soul, spirit, if he hadn't been raised, then, well, let's put it this way, if he hadn't been raised, we wouldn't be here. But because he did, well, as Paul says in verse 20, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, 
the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That's why we can say, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to hell. Uh, On the third day, He rose again. Oh, because we can say that. We can say that because He is risen from the dead, as Paul states. And in verse 21, For as by a man came death, by a man has come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. In the resurrection of Jesus, there is the proof of who Jesus is. And there is the certainty of the hope that we have. The certainty that the sin that we have done has been paid for. We've been set free. We've been adopted into God's family as His daughters and His sons through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, That is because the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive. And and that's that's the hope we have. Not a hope like a wish, like I hope you have a good day. I don't have any power over it, but I hope you do. No, this is a hope that is secure and sure because Jesus defeated death. And He is living for His people today. As our worship team comes up to lead us in a song of response, you know, in this season that we find ourselves in, there's all sorts of things we can start looking at that can really be discouraging, aren't there? (laughs) You just turn on the TV or listen to the latest news or open the latest newspaper and And there's a lot that is discouraging. There's a lot that can pull us down. There's a lot that say, where's the hope? Where's the hope in all of it? If if we were to put our hope in politics, where would that get us? If, if we were to put our hope in a, a, a cure this week for the virus, where would that put us? You know, it, it, we just go down the list. But here, this is where, this is the power of God's Word, that it challenges you and me, followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is where the power of the, the creed is, the Apostles' Creed, because It reminds us that, yes, we need to be engaged and looking around at the world around us, but we can't set our hope here. Our hope needs to be firmly set on the one who descended but then rose on that third day. That's the basis for our hope. That's what we can say to a world around us. Listen. From day to day, we don't know what's going to happen next. But here's the certainty that we do know. God is there for His people. Oh, as a matter of fact, here's this beautiful verse. Or verses. In Revelation chapter 21. Words of hope. Words of promise. Words that we can bank on because Jesus is risen. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. 
and death shall be no more. I'm going to keep reading in just a moment, but, you know, there's a sense of urgency to this today. This morning I got a text very early that a woman named Carol who comes to community, been dealing with sickness, dealing with struggling with illness for some time, sat right back there. After a long battle, she passed away this morning in the early hours. The loss is real. The grief is real. And there is that burden on on the hearts of her family. And yet also on their hearts is the knowledge that Carol trusted in Jesus. She followed Christ. And her hope was anchored in what Christ had done for her. So do we grieve? Yes, we grieve. But we do not grieve as those who have no hope. In other words, we may shed a tear, but we have hope because of what Jesus Christ did. And so now we hear these words. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all new. We can get caught in what's going on around us. But brothers and sisters, we need to look up. Because Jesus is there for His people, for you, for me. This day. So that we can go forth from this place and share with a world that needs hope, the sure and certain hope of the risen Jesus. Would you stand with me, please? Oh, Heavenly Father, there's so much more that could be said and explored. But Lord, we recognize that we are in a, in a world right now in tumult and turmoil. Peace seems elusive. And people are looking for hope, but they're not sure where to turn. Oh, Father, for those of us who follow Jesus, your sons, your daughters, oh, Lord, oppress upon us the mission that you have for us to to go out into the world and, and share the hope that we have. Not in a political system or medical cures or whatever, but Ultimately, our hope is founded on Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified, died, was buried. He descended to hell, to Sheol. And on that third day, on that third day, on that third day, he rose again to life. And he gives life to us. And we give you thanks. Oh, Lord, open up our eyes to what you're doing in and through us. And may our hearts be firmly fixed on our living Lord Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. And everybody said...